Hi there, can you guys hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we were muted. Okay, I hear you now. Does, that, does that look okay for you, Vanessa? Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. And can you hear him okay? I yeah, hear him perfectly. Okay, great. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay, so I am recording. Okay. Good to go. Ready. Okay. So uh, and just so you know, they're probably going to play the entire interview at some point, probably at six thirty. So just so you're aware of that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So Governor Steve Sisolak, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I have a bunch of questions for you here, so I'm going to try to get right through them. The first one is, what is the overall picture of testing in our state? Uh, we're short of kits, and we don't have enough. Uh, we have too many people we want to test and not enough uh, test kits and extraction kits. Uh, we have not gotten any test kits from the federal government. We are using the uh, lab in northern Nevada is assembling our own extraction kits. We're making them. Uh, by putting components together that we've been able to cobble together. We're distributing those around the state and then some of the private labs have acquired some of their own kits, but we do not have a supply of kits yet from the federal government to use. Ventilators, what are our needs? Is there a number, a goal for the state and what do we have now? Well, I think we have somewhere in the range of about 950-ish ventilators. I could get you the exact number, but uh, and then there's some we're going to be able to adapt another piece of equipment that would have gotten us up to about 1020. We need about 1500, so I'm about 450 ventilators short. Uh, I ask every single call that we get on, every one of our requests, we ask for ventilators. We have received no ventilators from the federal government, and uh, it's difficult. I'm on these governor's calls every single week, sometimes twice a week. Every state is asking for ventilators, 10,000, 20,000, 5,000. I want 450. If I could get 450, that'd be terrific. But uh, we're a small state, and I'm going up against California and New York and Florida and Michigan and Texas and the states that have uh, a lot more, uh, I guess, influence. They've got a lot more electoral votes than we have in Nevada, and we're punching way above our weight to get what we've gotten. But uh, ventilators, we haven't gotten any, and test kits, we haven't gotten any. PPE, we hear about the donations made by businesses, by individuals, but where are we with PPE? Uh, PPE is another one that we've gotten some from the federal government, nowhere near what we ordered, uh, but I appreciate every single mask and every glove I can get. And believe me, I'm not turning away anything. Uh, the business community has been absolutely incredible. I mean, nail salons and uh, restaurants and construction companies, have oftentimes stopped down and donated 50 or 100 or 20 and 95 masks or surgical masks. We got some big donations from uh, Sheldon Adelson at the Sands, donated, I believe, 100 and 150,000 masks. They flew in for us. Matt Maddox at Wynn donated, I believe, 100,000 or 150,000 masks, donated some PPEs. Uh, MGM donated uh, tens of thousands of masks. We've gotten some. We've gotten some that we've managed to put together that way from the generosity of some of our businesses in town here. We've got six and a half million dollars in emergency funds that we've uh, uh, had a special board of examiners meeting that now we're gonna have to go to IFC and ask for that money to be approved and we'll use that to get us PPEs and some of the other things that we need. Uh, the task force I put together with uh, Mr. Murrin and, and about six other folks have been incredible. You maybe you saw that today they announced that they've surpassed $10 million in donations. That money is all going to be used to buy these supplies that we so desperately need. And it's not only the money that they're able to provide me with. They have connections in Macau and in Asia that we don't have. Uh, we're working with Barrett Gold, and they've got some connections. So we're doing everything we can. We've got to think outside the box when you're the size of Nevada. We don't have the same supply lines and the same assets other states do. So that's what we're doing. We're using our creativity and ingenuity and all the resources I've got, everybody in my phone, I've called and asked for help. And, and this community has been so incredibly supportive. It's absolutely great. You see restaurants are bringing meals to our, you know, our hospital workers and our first responders. And that's absolutely great. And it's heartwarming when you see those kind of things happening. Um, what would you say to uh, 
I have my three-year-old son here because I'm working from home. <laughs> hey, how are you doing? He's trying to crash our interview. I had a feeling this might happen. I had some m and nearby to keep him distracted. I apologize. m ms are better than my interview. Stick with the m and <laughs> um, um, What would you say, we are hearing from healthcare workers inside hospitals who are concerned. They want to tell us what's happening as far as the PPE in hospitals. They're afraid of losing their jobs. Do you think the hospitals need to be perhaps more transparent? And what would you say to those healthcare workers who are making a sacrifice here? Uh, I want to be as transparent as we possibly can. I would encourage them to do the same thing. Well, the first thing I'd say to the healthcare workers that you're talking about is thank you. Thank you uh, from the bottom of my heart. What they're doing is incredible. I mean, they're going on the front lines. Oftentimes they can't sleep in the same bedroom as their spouse or sleep in the garage or another part of the home to avoid giving, uh, if they are uh, impacted with the COVID-19, to not spread it to their family members. They're taking those type of precautions, but they're showing up for work every day, not just on their schedule days, they're showing up every day on the front line doing everything they possibly can. And it's incumbent upon us to do as much as we possibly can. Now, I am not a doctor, I'm not a nurse, I'm not a hospital administrator. I don't know what their policies are, but my job is to make sure that we get enough PPE so that they can perform their functions in as safe a manner as possible. I'm committed to doing that, getting them everything that they need. That's why we put this task force together. That's why I call the National Guard up. I mean, they can take it out of these warehouses and deliver it to the hospitals and the medical centers where this, these things are needed. And, they're doing this for us. We got to make sure we do everything we can for them. And that involves providing them with the appropriate amount of PPE that they need. And I'm intent on doing that. How concerned are you that perhaps if we do not get enough ventilators here and our numbers continue to spike, that some really tough decisions are going to have to be made about who, who will, which patients get the ventilators? <sighs> That's hard to even think about, but it's a reality that we're facing. Uh, I listened to Governor Cuomo say, well, geez, let New York have them. And then when they're done, they can ship them to the West Coast. There's not enough time for them to be done with them and then ship them to the West Coast. Ventilators are in extremely short supply. Uh, I'm very worried. We don't have enough ventilators, one for every room that we're going to need. Uh, the curve is going to get a lot higher than it is now. Uh, those are tough decisions that medical professionals are going to have to make. And I cannot begin to imagine what it would be like to make a decision like that or how they're going to make that type of a decision. But it doesn't have to get that bad. If we could only get people to follow the restrictions, the protocols that we put in place, if we could get them, stay home for Nevada, stay in your house. I mean, when you grow out, you know, don't go out to groups of 10 or more. I mean, keep six feet away from so everybody when the grocery store. The only way this virus can spread is if we let it spread, if we're the assist in letting it spread. We have to stop it. It has to stop with our citizens. Unfortunately, when I drive into work, I still see eight, 10 kids on the basketball court at the school I drive by playing basketball together or large groups gathered in a parking lot at a convenience store. That is not social distancing. If, if you don't do it for yourself, if, you, if you're, think you're in, you, it can't touch you because you're too young or you're too tough or you're whatever it is, do it for your family, do it for your mother, do it for your grandfather, do it for a next door neighbor, but do it for Nevada. Stay home for Nevada and follow our protocols and we can get in front of this virus. Are you considering stricter enforcement? If people don't listen, and don't follow the protocols that we've set in place, I have no choice but to do more along the line of enforcement. I have no choice. I'm not getting a lot of sleep anymore. I mean, to shut off the lights on Las Vegas Boulevard, I've never, that's something I'd have to think about, the hundreds of thousands of people that lost their job the day that I said we're turning off those lights. To shut off the schools, to say we're closing our schools, it's been three weeks now. That was something that just tore me up to do that. These are not easy decisions, decisions that I take lightly. I mean, if people don't want to listen, we're going to have to take more drastic measures. The problem is the people that are listening, listening are going to follow the more drastic regulations. The other people aren't following them anyway. That's what's so frustrating. So if you could just please 
tell a neighbor, tell a friend, tell your family members, follow through. I mean, my wife's told me we've had people invite us over for Easter dinner. You're not supposed to have Easter dinner and invite neighbors over to the house. Pastor, you're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to have neighbor Easter dinner with your family, your household family, not extended family, cousins, aunts, and uncles that you haven't seen in four years, your immediate family in your house. That's it. That's all that's supposed to be there. If we do that, we can make a difference. I just have a few more questions for you. Uh, one is, are you considering any state guidance as far as masks for the public? We are. We're issue, not for masks. We're calling them uh, face coverings, I guess you'd call it. We are so des. In an ideal world, I would like to give everybody a box of PPE. That'd be great. Then you'd have one you could wear at whatever time. There is no harm in wearing a face covering, whether that be a scarf, whether that be a, uh, a bandana, whatever it might be to cover your respiratory so they can block out particles both going out you know, and, and keep you and other people safe. I do not want people to go buy surgical masks or N95 masks that are so desperately needed in our hospitals to wear to go to the grocery store and pick out your produce. I want people to practice social distancing in the grocery store. Would it be a nice thing for them to wear a scarf or bandana in the grocery store? Yeah, that's probably a good idea. And we're gonna put out uh, a directive in that regard, especially as it relates to a face covering, but it's really not a mask. Now, if you can make one, and I know my daughter is pretty creative, they got these sewing things where you can sew them and make them look in there. That's great, that's not a surgical mask, that's a face covering. And yeah, I would encourage people to do that if they'd like to. Um, leading the state through a public health crisis, I noticed on a personal level during a couple of the news conferences, you sort of got choked up. Um, can, can you talk about that, leading a state through a public health crisis and watching our numbers go up? Uh, you're going to give me a show there. Now, when I see this report every morning, and I see six more people have died, five more people have died, 11 people died. We've had 50 more positives. We're up to 1,500 positives. This is not the flu. People that think this is something that's just going to go away and like another flu, it's not going to. It breaks my heart every day when I see these numbers and I see them go up and I see the projections and I've got doctors, I've got scientists, I've got statisticians explaining curves to me and how to flatten the curve and how to decrease the, the exponential growth. And I know what we have to do and I'm not doing a good enough job getting people to follow my instructions. That's really frustrating when I know what would stop this. If we could just get everybody to stay home, it would be terrific. But when I have to drive home tonight, I'm going to see a lot more cars on the road than should be on their own. They should be home already, but they're not home. They're not following this. They're not taking it serious enough. And unfortunately, sometimes it takes so much. They're going to have to have somebody they know or love be infected, and then they're going to get it. But when I have to talk to a person that can't visit a dying grandparent, in the convalescent home because they can't let visitors in or they can't get into the hospital to see a spouse that's terminal because we have restrictions. That's pretty rough. That's pretty rough. And I'm just imploring all of your viewers to please follow these protocols. And uh, these are hard times that we're all facing and I'd be disingenuous if I said it wasn't weighing heavy on my heart because it is. I'm just gonna ask you one more question. Um, it is hard to report these facts. Some of them are difficult to hear, um, but some people are turning this into a, a political fight. Watching you call out the federal government for not sending supplies. What would you say to that? And could the state have been better prepared? I think the state, we got out in front of this more than most states did. We closed our schools quicker. We put a stay in place order quicker. We instituted social guidances quicker. I'm not blaming the federal government. I'm really not. People that want to make this into a political fight, this is so much more important than politics. It's, it's beyond the pale to me. What I'm saying is the federal government, like I said, I listen to these calls. Every governor, I'm one of 54 people when you count the territories that are on these calls. I'm one of 54 and every one of us are asking for the same thing. Now, I don't know how you decide who gets what. I don't know. Uh, that'd be a tough call. It's like, how do you decide which patient gets a ventilator and which one doesn't get a ventilator? I don't have to make that call on the federal level. 
I have to make the call of fighting and scrapping for every single piece of PPE that we can get for Nevada, for our front end providers. I have to fight for every single mask and every pair of gloves. I will continue to do that, even though I'm fighting against bigger states. And when I have to go outside of the box and implore the private sector to come and raise money, we go down the open market to do it. That's what the president told us to do. He said, governors, go out and find it on your own. So that's what I've decided to do. We're going out and we're buying our own. We're buying it on the open market. But some of it is hard. And, and I know every governor is facing this. And I don't know what the fairest way to allocate this PPE is. But we had a stockpile of material that we've used all ours at the state. And now we're having to procure more. So this is, this is so far beyond politics. But we're talking about life and death. This is not a game show. It's not a reality show. It's not a movie. This is our life. People are dying today. We're going to have more people die tomorrow and more people die on Sunday. And pretty soon our death total is going to get into the triple digits. And if that's what it takes, I do not understand what it's going to get take to get people to understand just how serious and how important this is. And I'm pleading with your viewers. I'm begging them, please take us serious and stay home. We can stop this if we stop it ourselves. Is there anything you want to add? No, I appreciate the opportunity. Just please stay home for Nevada. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good.